Look, hello everyone. Uh, well, welcome from the Australian National University and I hope that you and your loved ones are keeping safe and healthy. Uh, my name is Jay and I look after international relations and partnerships here at the ANU in the areas of sciences, health and medicine. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleague Arthur Shu and of course, our speaker for today, Professor David Nisbet. Uh, before we start, I would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people who are the traditional owners of the land where ANU is located and where we are broadcasting to you today from. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Now, let me introduce our speaker for today, Professor David Nisbet. Uh, Dave is a professor here at the Australian National University where he holds a joint appointment between the Research School of Chemistry and the John Curtin School of Medical Research. He is also head of the Laboratory of Advanced Biomaterials uh, with research labs in both the schools here at the ANU. Dave's research interests focus on developing novel biomaterials and he is particularly passionate about seeing the biomaterials developed for clinical applications. In his research group, he has brought together interdisciplinary teams of engineers, chemists and biologists who are all working together to create novel materials to help combat injury and disease. Dave completed his PhD at Monash University, then spent some time at University of California, Berkeley, uh, before coming to the ANU. Uh, Dave and his research group have won many awards, fellowships, and grants, uh, including both from the Australian Research Council and the National Health and Medical Research Council. Many of the PhD honors students that Dave has supervised uh, have gone on to develop successful careers in research and industry. Without any further delay, I'll now hand over to Professor David Nisbet so he can tell us more about novel biomaterials uh, can be engineered, how they can be engineered, and the important role that they are going to play in the health and well-being of our society in the near future. Over to you, Dave. Ah, perfect. Thanks, Joe. Um, I think my just check my microphone's on. Uh, yep. Um, yeah, so uh, I thought I'd start with just a little bit of an introduction into uh, current, some of the current challenges and obviously uh, healthcare is a, a pretty prevalent one um, recently. Um, and I suppose the goal uh, of, of healthcare is to try and achieve a more personalised, effective, sustainable and equal healthcare system. And that's what I'm sort of all about. So, um, I mean, what do we know? We know that populations are ageing. I think between um, 2015 and 2050, it's estimated that there's gonna be approximately 2.1 billion people that are over the age of 60. Um, and with this, uh, the, the, it means that there's gonna be more and more people that are experiencing several, several diseases simultaneously, uh, which is known as uh, multiple morbidity. Um, we, we also know that there's a very slow diffusion of, of, uh, of, of healthcare technologies. Um, so, you know, for new drugs and uh, medical devices, it can take up to on average 17 years for those products to, to reach market. And that's just too slow. Um, we know that healthcare expenditure is uh, incredibly expensive. Um, so uh, in the US uh, between, uh, well, by 2028, it's predicted that healthcare expenditure will be about $6.2 trillion. So it's, it's a massive uh, uh, financial expense to companies. Um, and with, so we, we, we need to reduce that cost significantly, but in doing that, we also need to actually increase the patient's experience. So a recent survey conducted in Australia estimated that only one of three people that responded to the survey thought that they were getting the best tools uh, and best possible uh, consumer digital sort of experience in, in healthcare. So we need to try and improve that. Um, okay. I have to use my keyboard. Okay. Um, okay, so the challenges are, are personalization of medicine. Um, so this is particularly important for, um, for, for some of the research that I'm doing. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, um, biomaterials and, and medical devices haven't sort of reached their, their true potential as yet um, because of the continued focus of the healthcare system on this sort of one size fits all approach. So what we need to do is we need to sort of um, personalize um, interventions uh, so have sort of a, you know customizable chemistry uh, and materials that can actually address the patient's uh, specific you know iatrogenic injury uh, disease state or, or, or whatnot. Um, cyber security is another big one um, I mean there was a recent ransomware attack and data breaches at the ANU that's just showing how vulnerable we are to cyber attacks uh, and obviously that's a major issue with, with patient inter um, um, information. Um, telehealth, so, you know, with COVID, obviously, we're trying to reduce our in-person interactions and, um, and we saw that uh, telehealth had grown in Australia, at least, uh, by about 76%. 
Um, and, and more than 80% of consumers are saying that they'd like that to continue. But with that comes uh, other challenges. So again, this sort of um, security of patient data, but also, you know, if you imagine a patient um, presenting with something like Alzheimer's disease or dementia, really a, a telehealth experience is never gonna replace that sort of one-to-one um, face-to-face interactions that you need with, with the clinicians. Um, big data. So, I mean, for, for health organisations to really successfully harness the power of big data, leadership within these organisations really needs to embrace sort of data-driven um, decision-making processes. Um, and the use of analytics should be sort of woven into these organisational cultures to develop trust in data um, and, and actually uh, with, the, with the clinicians, but also, also with those patients. Uh, and then finally, we need to, like I've already mentioned, accelerate these translational pathways. And I think this is where, this is one of the positives of, of, of COVID is that we're trying to accelerate the development of and, um, and implementation of vaccines, right? So that we can open up economies and, and borders again. Um, and so hopefully what we can do is we can actually translate many of the lessons learned there into medical devices to actually improve um, the you know, um, patient wellbeing. Okay, I don't know why my mouse isn't looking, but um, okay. So um, what do we do in my lab? Well, we try to address many of these challenges. Um, so we're engineering a different materials for, for healthcare applications. And we do a lot of work in um, uh, medical diagnostics. We do some stem cell transplantation technologies. We look at making um, ex vivo disease models, bionics, um, a whole bunch of different biomaterials for things like cell reprogramming, gene therapy, drug delivery, um, those sorts of things, and um, to that, and, and pathogen-resistant coatings. And I'm going to talk uh, briefly uh, about most of these things today, but I will go into detail uh, and, and talk a lot about these um, uh, ex vivo models of disease states and what we've done there, uh, and some of the, the stem cell transplantation work we've been doing, specifically for stroke. We work in Parkinson's disease and a whole bunch of different applications also, but today I'm just going to focus on these stroke applications. Okay, so I'm just going to start by showing, uh, I suppose, three little stories about some of the work that we're doing before I get into those sort of two major things that I want to present on. So we do do a lot of work in collaboration um, with, a, with several universities uh, around the world on trying to improve bone implants. So if you imagine like a knee or a hip implant, um, we're trying to improve the longevity of these implants. Um, so currently what happens is that these implants, are, these titanium implants are either put into the body and they're not coated at all. Um, so they're just sort of textured titanium or they're coated with uh, a, a, a inorganic material known as hydroxyapatite. Um, and the way they coat this is using a flame spray technique. And basically what they generate is this sort of rough surface sort of which we've replicated here as a spin coated sample. Um, so what we actually did is we invented a way uh, using flame spray pyrolysis to actually generate ultra porous um, coatings of, of, of this hydroxyapatite. The idea being that we can actually encourage cell infiltration into these coatings and better fixation. So you don't get this loosening effect that occurs, um, which results in the need for revision surgeries. And I can show uh, some pictures here of this. Um, so basically this is differences in porosity as we go across the top here. And what we found in, in the green here are false colored um, bone cells growing on, on these coatings. And what we found is that when the porosity increased above 80%, we started to see these bone cells sending known as filopodia, but extensions into these, um, these highly porous materials. And you can sort of see them really clearly here where they're growing in under and, and, and through these highly porous materials. And then what we're seeing is we're actually seeing these cells are, uh, it's called remineralization and it happens in um, bones when you have fractures and things like that. And we can see them actually mineralizing within that coating. So we're getting that superior fixation um, to eliminate the needs for revision surgeries for, for patients that have these implants. So the next uh, project I just wanted to rapidly introduce before I get to the main stories is, um, is, is some of the work uh, that we're doing on um, advanced uh, coding technologies. And I do have a bit of a financial disclosure for the next uh, two slides. I, I have a startup company with Antonio Tripoli here. Um, and so we do have a financial interest in the next couple of slides here. Um, but what we managed to do is we, uh, we, we created an ultra durable um, super hydrophobic coating. So you can imagine that these coatings can be um, 
they, they basically resist water. So you can use them as anti-fogging coatings for glasses, uh, you know, buildings like your windows. So you don't need to actually clean your windows and, and things like that. Um, as they really, they just stop any, they sort of self-cleaning and stop any uh, accumulation of dirt and water on the surfaces. And I have a movie of that here. Um, and you can see this sort of water droplet dropping down on the surface and it just bounces and rolls off these surfaces just because of the surface energies that we've created there. Um, and the real advantage of our system compared to any other previous reports for, um, globally um, is that we managed to uh, achieve a, so an ultra durable coating. So we have this sort of abrasion test that you can see here. Um, we run these weighted wheels over the surfaces and we, they're basically like sandpaper and we can go out to about 300 cycles and any coatings that we tested um, that have previously been port, reported in the literature are, are degrading uh, with, this is probably a, 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 between an eight and a tenfold improvement on those coatings. Um, and what you can see here, this is an Australian dollar coin. Um, with the, you can sort of see the kangaroo in his ears here. Um, and what we did is we coated this coin um, with, the, with, the, with this technology and you can see that it's transparent. Um, and we've just dyed the water blue. And you can see this is the student William here, uh, his reflection in the, in the in the droplet. Um, but what you can see here is the, the wall of water around the outsides of the, uh, of the coin. So it's actually parting the water. It's called the Moses effect. So you've got this sort of, the surface energies are so great that it's actually holding the water back off the surface of this coin, um, which really demonstrates our, the technology really well. Now, um, we're using this for a whole bunch of different applications. We've got some collaborations with Carl Zeiss who make lenses. Um, and we've just, I just wanted to show this slide to show that this is actually an oil droplet dropping, a toluene droplet dropping on the surfaces. Um, so it's not just water, it can resist. You can see it bouncing on the surface here. It can resist oil contamination and things like that. So if you imagine for your, for your glasses, if you could resist dirt accumulating on it and also uh, fingerprints and things like that, it's, um, it's quite a, um, a, a neat technology. But um, one of the first market sectors we're going to go after is um, actually for antiviral. Um, these surfaces are antiviral and, and pathogen resistant. Um, so if we look at bacteria, so we all know about the sort of rise of antibiotic resistant bacteria, superbugs, um, which has the potential to, in the future, represent a, you know, another sort of pandemic if our antibiotics start to fail against um, bacterial strain. Um, and so what we found is that these coatings can resist bacteria. So what they actually do, this is sort of the coating in orange here, is they, they, they form this air layer called a plaston layer, which actually stop the liquid phase making any contact with the surface whatsoever. Um, so the bacteria can't sort of colonize that surface. And you can see that here, this white line is that sort of bacterial, uh, is that air layer. So the bacteria can't actually make contact with the surface. Um, but what we were thinking about is, well, what happens then um, if we submerge it for extended periods of time, or if those surfaces are not pristine and they're damaged and the bacteria that can then start to colonize these surfaces. Um, so what we did is we actually start then imparted some um, um, super hydro, uh, some um, metal organic frameworks in there. So we have a, a bactericidal coating aspect to the coating and we can show that we can actually submerge these for over nine days um, and they can sustain significant damage and they're completely resistant to bacteria. Um, but obviously the, some of this work was happening before the pandemic, but obviously with the pandemic, we started to check test the surfaces for viral load. Um, and you can see this here, this is HIV virus, so actually much more stable than the, than the COVID virus. Um, and what you can see here is that when we have an uncoated, the blue uncoated seal sample, we still got virus after four vigorous washes. Um, but when we have these coating surfaces, particularly without the, the metal organic framework, um, basically it resists uh, any virus contamination. We're putting this into a really high concentration um, solution of virus, way more than you would get from a sneeze or, or, or something like that. Um, but you can see after a single wash, it's completely gone. So these surfaces are resistance to, to, to viruses and bacteria. And the final um, thing I wanted to, to share is actually a uh, project I'm involved with that involves pretty much all parts of the ANU. And it's sort of what I was talking about with the healthcare system where we need to develop new approaches um, to try and make the system more fair, equal and reduce the costs. And this actually, I suppose on a university level, this project really summarizes how that's occurring. Um, as I said, it's all, all aspects of the, of the university are involved in this project. I'm involved in the sensor technology and development part of this, this, um, this program and I lead the sort of biofunctionalization areas of this project. Um, but particularly, I'm just going to introduce one thing we're doing. What we're looking at is we're trying to um, uh, detect uh, diseases such as diabetes or MS um, before there's any clinical symptoms so that early, you know, early intervention can lead to sort of better outcomes. 
Um, so what I'm going to show here is actually some technologies where we're, um, we're developing a sensor to, to um, monitor um, a patient's uh, diabetes, or like glucose level over a, a three-week period um, so that we can get it basically uh, to monitor diabetes. So what we've done is we've, uh, we've got this sort of flame spray uh, pyrolysis technique. And what we can do is we can actually generate sort of these gold nano islands onto an electrode surface as a, as a, as a biosensor. And you can see these here, these are all little gold nano islands that we can produce. We can control the size of these and the spacings of these nano islands to, to um, some extent. And then what we do is um, we, we're basically using that as a sensor to detect glycotated albumin, um, exploiting that as a marker, a biomarker for diabetes. So the sensors, I suppose, as I mentioned, designed to provide a, a mean glucose level of, for a diabetes patient over a three-week period, which basically indicates their gly glycation state and, um, and of the diabetes. Um, so we're using um, localised surface plasmonic resonance um, as, a, as a means of signal transduction for the biosensor. So to achieve this, the gold nano islands are then functionalised with this um, uh, glycotate albumin that I'm talking about. And then what happens is uh, basically we have, we conjugate a DNA aptima onto the surfaces of this gold, and then that selectively binds that glycotate albumin and you see a plasmonic wave shift uh, when that occurs. So then we can detect how much is there um, and monitor it in real time. And we've shown this to be highly selective, way more selective than um, um, and sensitive uh, than the concentrations of, of, of GA in our, in our bodies which is always handy because it's much easier to dilute a sample than it is to try and concentrate it. Okay, so I'm gonna move on now and talk about the first uh, thing that I wanted to go into a bit more detail about, which is um, some of our ex vivo models where we're decoupling uh, brain injury from inflammation. Um, and this was uh, largely driven, well, a lot out of my PhD actually, and then um, Francesca McLean was continuing a lot of this work in collaboration with a, with a couple of folk down at, um, at Melbourne University. Um, but interestingly, so a lot of this work has led to a couple of other projects. So we have a project now um, with Monash University where we're using a lot of this technology to actually functionalize electrodes. So basically one of the problems, one of the reasons electrodes fail, whether they're sort of the, the cochlear implant or whether they're the bionic eye, um, is you get this sort of scar formation and an insulating layer around the electrode. So excitable neural elements can't grow into close proximity. So what we're doing is we're actually using a, a lot of the work I'm going to show you to actually control the inflammation around these electrodes and encourage the neurons to grow and flow into close proximity with them. Um, and the second thing that we're doing is we're actually using um, this technology to form a synthetic blood brain barrier on a chip um, with colleagues down at um, uh, Melbourne University, um, where they're interested in looking at, um, I suppose, a blood brain barrier and how electrical, acoustical and optical signals um, can um, help transport drugs and, and small molecules across the blood brain barrier for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so basically what we're using is my technology here to form that, syn that, that synthetic blood brain barrier so that they can actually do a lot of their testings in, in their project. Okay, so I just wanted to quickly, uh, a lot of you might not know much about brain inflammation, so I wanted to just um, rapidly introduce what it is. So um, brain injury is followed by uh, and an inflammatory response that includes astrocytes, so one of the, the most abundant cell in your brain, um, proliferating locally and becoming reactive. Um, initially, this process is to defend against sort of foreign proteins and um, damaged cells and to try and maintain tissue integrity. Um, but unfortunately, I, I suppose a continuation um, uh, or acute um, uh, reactivity of these cells results in, in scarring. Uh, within the brain, um, which basically means that um, it's an important physiological event. It basically means that the brain just isolates that region that it can't, um, where it can't, you know, consume uh, the damaged proteins and, and, and so on, basically to protect the rest of the brain integrity. But as a result of that, you can't get any repair or reconstruction within that void. So basically what, what we, we were trying thinking is that we can promote optimal recovery, recovery from brain injury and, and so on if there's if we can control this, this, this scarring event that occurs within the brain. Okay, so I mean, one of the ways in which we did this, I did a lot of this work over in Berkeley is we were actually having a look at these astrocytes and this is all done outside the body at this stage. Um, and we were looking at how we can control them. And one way in which we can control them, this is, these here are the astrocyte cells. We've used, a, it's called a GFAP protein, we've marked here uh, in green. And when we, whenever you grow an astrocyte in, in the cell culture plate, and it's not actually in your brain, they're always reactive. Um, and you can see that here, they're big, 
Um, they've got a high, big, very large cytoplasmic volume and they're very stellated. They're sending out these really long fibers and, and they'll ultimately form this scar tissue, um, which you can sort of see here after four and 12 days in, in culture. What we found is that um, when, we, when we actually offered these sort of three dimensional um, architectures within the brain, um, so this sort of fibrous morphologies, these are electrospun um, polylactic acid fibers, which is the same as the sort of degradable stitches that you might get from a dentist that you don't have to remove. But when we offered this sort of three dimensionality, I think you can see here that there's a much lower cytoplasmic volume and these cells are, have a very different morphology um, to, the, to the ones up here that are, um, that are inflamed. So we actually managed to maintain them in a, in a state in vitro for the first time, um, which were not inflammatory. So they're sort of like the healthy astrocytes would be in your, in your brain. And actually we correlated that to an expression of F and G actin ratios. And basically what you can see is when they become more cytotrophic, so more like a, a, a healthy, like an astrocyte in your healthy brain, you can see they have a lot of this G actin protein. So what we actually pioneered was a, a way, previously people were just looking at the reactivity of these cells morphologically. And we pioneered a way where we could do this by looking at an F and G actin ratio, which I'm showing there. And so I suppose it's a bit of background. Um, in my PhD years ago, uh, we were looking at um, the bone injury response of these astrocytes. And you can see when we put an, a needle stick in green, what happens is you, you, you poke the needle into the brain of a, of a rat. And then after three days, you see this activation. So you get a lot of proliferation and migration of these astrocytes. Um, and this is called the reactive astrocytosis. And this lasts for about say 21 days before it starts to sort of really start to subside back down to homeostatic levels by 60 days. Um, interestingly, um, what we do see is when they can switch um, from, this to this, from this sort of inflammatory state, and they will increase a little bit at the 16 week time point as they switch back towards their cytotrophic behavior where they actually physically and biochemically support neurons. Um, so that's their role basically for a neuron to survive in your brain, it has to have a blood vessel and an astrocyte adjacent to it. But what we found is we put this hydrogel called xyloglucan, it's used as a thickening, thickening agent in, um, in Japan. It's made, um, made from seaweed. Uh, um, and basically what we found was um, that uh, we saw a suppression, I suppose, of this inflammatory response. And we didn't know why for years, but actually what we determined was that it was actually due to a sugar moiety on that, on that, um, on that hydrogel, which was suppressing the inflammation. And basically it was doing this through um, uh, inhibiting the, um, the rock row signaling pathway within the astrocytes. So, it inter so on the cell, there's all these receptors that respond to different proteins and it was actually inhibiting a certain pathway within the cell, which was then resulting in, um, in, in, in uh, that cytoscalable change from that reactive state back to that cytotrophic phenotype. So I won't go into too much biology here, but uh, what I did want to show, these are all just markers of sort of these, this, the reactivity of, a, of an astrocyte. Um, but the important thing here is when we culture them in 2D, like I said, they're always reactive. When we cultured them in 3D, in the gray here and all the other groups, you can see we've reduced that level of, of, of reactivity. Now, what we did is we wanted to present that sugar moiety, the galactose that I was talking about earlier on the surfaces of these, this three dimensional morphology um, and see what happened. Um, because what we saw when we had this sort of 3D morphology is that after four days of in vitro culture, yes, it's suppressed. But if we go to 12 days of in vitro culture, you can see they're inflammatory again, okay? So we're not getting that sustained suppression of this reactive state. Um, so what we did is we, we did a layer by layer deposition. It's just a way to functionalize the surfaces of these fibers just to present this um, lactobinic acid. So this galactose loyalty on there. And you can see basically after four days in vitro, all these markers are down regulated. But apart from when we have the, the three dimensional morphology and the galactose present, after 12 days, they're, they're inflammatory again. But as I mentioned, when we have those two things in combination, we can actually inhibit that rock row signaling pathway for much longer, and we can maintain them for 12 days in vitro um, in, in that cytotrophic phenotype. And that had never been done before. So we can act, we've actually made an in vitro model now of the healthy brain, not just the injured brain, which, which previously existed. Okay, so this is all well and good, but as I mentioned, what we were doing here is we were functionalizing electrospun materials. So um, basically what they look like is they basically look like a, a membrane, like a little bit of tissue paper. So if you imagine if you're trying to implant them into a, a, a lesion in your brain after stroke, you have to sort of roll this up and then stuff it into the, the void and it's just not practical at all. 
So what we did is we pioneered a way of uh, making the uh, minimally invasive delivery method while still presenting this fibrous morphology. So we actually developed some um, self-assembling peptide materials. Um, so these, some of these previously existed, um, but they were, non, they were just biologically inert. They weren't biologically active in any way. But what we did is we managed to develop a way to present different um, sequences of amino acids that are biologically relevant and can support and instruct cell behavior. So things like um, IKVAV, RGD, PHSRN, we have a whole library of these. Today, what I'm gonna talk about is an IKVAV epitope, which is basically a, 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 a binding epitope from lamin, the alpha one um, chain of lamin, and which lamin is the most abundant protein within our brains. So that's why we've sort of done that. So what we do is we have this FMOC protecting group, this aromatic group on the end here, and then we assemble this IKVAV uh, amino acids here, and then at high, high uh, pH, these are charged and solubilized, so they're sort of floating around in a liquid. And then we use a pH switch, so we just lower that pH down, and what we get is we get this sort of pi pi stacking of these aromatic FMOC groups, and then you get beta sheet formation between your amino acids, and they roll up and they form these sort of hollow nanotubes that you can see here, that then bundle together to form this sort of fibrous scaffold, similar to what I showed on the previous slide, but as an injectable hydrogel. And the real uh, beauty of this system is that you shear it, so we shake it in the clinic, uh, and it turns back into a liquid, you inject it, and it reassembles in situ, so it's sort of a smart system. Okay, so then what we did is we actually functionalized this hydrogel with a molecule known as phacoidin, um, basically again to present that galactose moiety. Um, and what you can see here, this is a, this, these are pictures of the brain. Um, so this is a, a lesion, the, the black here is a lesion. These are all at the same magnification, but this is a stab injury and you can see this fibrous like growth of these, these astrocytes here. Um, and it's really messy and disorganized. Once we have this uh, hydrogel presented into the void, so the hydrogel is where the black is here, you can see that there's a much, much less reactivity. But what I hope you can see is that when we come across and we start presenting this, this galactose, is you start to see a lot more organization of these astrocytes and they start to physiologically look a lot more like a healthy astrocyte in the uninjured brain. Now, importantly, we were confused for a long time why the stab looked worse than the unfunctionalized materials. And basically what, what's happening here is um, you can see the, the void's actually quite small comparatively to these ones. What you get is you get a whole bunch of tissue collapse into that void. So you, then you're basically getting micro tearing through the whole um, brain penumbra and that's resulting in increased activation. So you get actually get a lot more, if you, the deeper we go into the tissue, there's still a lot with a stab of, 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 of reactive astrocytes. But just by having that physical support here of the hydrogel, we've reduced a lot of that. And then when we present that galactose, we switch their behavior from this sort of this is still reactive, very disorganized, very fibrous to these sort of highly organized cells that look like um, nearly like starfish. Um, so then what we did is we actually wanted to have a, a programmable uh, inflammatory model of the brain. So um, Francesca took this back outside the body again. Um, we cast these gels into a, a chamber slide and then put the astrocytes either underneath them or top them or within them. And then we can challenge them with things like interleukin one alpha LPS, just to really make them activated um, like an injury, like a real injury state. And then what we do is uh, when we have this phacoidin present, so we can actually start to program the systems and turn infl inflammation on and off just by putting these soluble molecules in. And you can see they switch. There's a lot less red in these. And but what the important part here is you can actually see um, this sort of cobblestone morphology. So that's exactly what an astrocyte looks like in a healthy brain when they're physically and biochemically supporting neurons. So we can actually challenge them, make them reactive, make them a scar, and then we can switch them back into a, into a, a, a cobblestone uh, native cytotrophic morphology. And that's really important because if you're delivering drugs um, to a patient, say with Alzheimer's disease, their brain is actually not damaged anyway. There won't be a lot of uh, you know, reactivity in terms of the astrocytes. And we wanna know how those drugs respond in the healthy uninjured brain, not just the injured brain. And also, um, I mean, if you imagine a, a traumatic event, traumatic brain injury, that inflammation isn't gonna last forever. So you need to know how the different approaches and therapies can be tuned um, as the inflammation starts to subside and we can actually try to promote repair and reconstruction. So this is a really valuable tool. Um, I'm just showing a picture here about um, 
is, is this like a pseudo 3D model? Um, so basically you put the astrocytes on the bottom, you cast the hydrogel on top, and then you can deliver your molecules within that hydrogel. Uh, you can see that cobblestone morphology, but we can, we can mix them within the gels also. They're a lot harder to image, but I think you can see this sort of three-dimensional cobblestone morphology now of a, basically like a, nearly like an organoid structure within the, within the brain. And the final thing I wanted to talk about before I switch to talk about some of our cell transplantation work um, is basically we went back into a brain injury. So this is a, 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 a mouse brain. You can see the big void here and we put the hydrogel in. And so what you can see here is this fibrous scar that's been forming like I was talking about. But as soon as the, the cells migrate into the hydrogel, you can see they've switched their morphologies and they've got this cobblestone cytotrophic morphology. So the really take home message here is that we can actually switch the inflammatory state from this aggressive um, um, sort of cytotoxic uh, event that's occurring, reactive events that's occurring, we can actually switch it to a, the, these cells to a cytotrophic state even within an active scar site, despite all the biomolecules that have been secreted. Okay, so the next story I, I just wanted to talk about um, rapidly was uh, some of our work where we're looking at um, using these materials that I've previously presented, these self-assembly peptides, uh, to improve cell transplantation. And this is a highly collaborative project um, with a lot of different universities um, around the world. Um, but actually some of the earlier work that I'm going to present now is actually led again into another few um, interesting projects. Um, so I have a project now with um, Gon Chen and Alan Harvey, where we're looking at um, using these materials for cell reprogramming. And this is really exciting because it actually could eliminate the need to use um, stem cells or patient iPS cells uh, in stem cell grafting. Because what we can actually do here is we can actually um, use a combination of techniques to directly induce a astrocyte, which I've just spent a lot of time talking about, directly into a neuron. So what we could actually do is um, use the body's inflammatory response the proliferation and migration of these cells into an injury event and then reprogram them into neurons once they're once they've reached that void surface which is quite exciting um, and another one here we're actually i can't talk too much about it because we're putting a, a pattern in on this but um we've actually made a, a a way of presenting a synthetic blood system so part of the problem when you do these large stem cell graphs is they don't have a blood supply so we have developed a, a means of presenting a, a synthetic blood system to encourage better um, graph survival, so stem cells survival upon transplantation, and more importantly, better innovation. So better growth of, um, I suppose, the, the neurites, the, the white matter tracts throughout the brain tissue. And you can see that here where we've got a lot more, the core here is bigger, but we've got a lot more innovation throughout the tissue, which I've tried to highlight here with a black line. Okay, so um, what we did here, and this is all a uh, collaborative work with, um, with a close colleague, Claire Parrish down at, oops, wait, what's happening here? Uh, down at um, Melbourne University. Um, but what we basically did is we spent a lot of time making these sort of necrotic brain injuries. So this is a huge injury. You can see we blow out a, a major area of the brain here. Um, we use endothelium one administration to do this uh, and, uh, and they're reproducible injuries, which is important because we're gonna do a lot of behavior on these animals. Uh, and then what we can do is we can put uh, our, our stem cell our, um, materials in alone, our stem cells in alone. And one of the data I'm gonna present on today is using a human forebrain progenitor cells. Um, so they're um, differentiated from one of the Obama approved stem cell lines. Uh, and then we can put it in with our material as well. Um, and because we're putting a human cell in a rat, we have to use these guys, these nude rats, um, which is, makes it a bit more expensive. Uh, and initially what we did is we did one week um, post injury. So one week we formed this, we wait a week, then we put the materials or the cells in um, to look at the ability of the systems to both protect and replace cells. And we look at three weeks. So after a three week period, all the, bias, all the cells in the surrounding parameter would have died off. And so all we're looking at then is replacement. And I'm gonna start just by showing um, some of the behavior here. So basically you injure an animal. We did a whole bunch of behavioral testing um, this is all published, but um, uh, the green here is an injury animal. You can see this is a nine month study. Um, that's how long it takes for a human forebrain progenitor cell to mature. And you can see there's no, uh, not a single bit of uh, functional recovery in these animals. Um, how this test works actually, interestingly, uh, is it's called a staircase test. We did a whole bunch of balance tests and so on. But what you do here is you basically put sugar tablets up each side of the, of the staircase. Um, and then the rat will go up it and uh, on basically on the contralateral side of the injury, it loses uh, coordinated pore function. Um, so it can't actually eat those tablets. So and that's what we're basically measuring here. 
um, is a difference between the contralateral and ipsilateral side of the, of the brain. Um, and what you can see with the red here when we put the stem cell graft in it is that after nine months, we do see a significant improvement in coordinated poor function um, with the stem cell graft, but more striking and even after 24 weeks when we have the material present, because we're presenting that IKVAV epitope and we're using a material as a delivery system um, to protect the cells during administration, we're getting these larger graphs um, and, and, and we're presenting relevant um, biological motifs to encourage their survival integration and we're getting much better uh, functional recovery even than with the stem cell graph when we have the materials and the stem cells. So then we spent a bit of time looking at why that's occurring and you can see that in these uh, brain slices here. But basically the reason that that's occurring is um, because we're, we're regenerating the cortical tissue. Um, so you can see the lesion down and all, there's a lot of cortical atrophy. If we put in the peptide material, either early or late intervention alone, there's actually no statistical difference whatsoever. So the material on its own is doing nothing. It needs to be a combination of both. When we have the cells alone, there is, a, is an improvement. Um, we see approximately a halving in atrophy, um, but there was no difference between early and late intervention. But really interesting, you can see the atrophy here is down to about 5% um, with early inter 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 intervention and about 12% with late intervention. So we've really reduced that, that amount of cortical atrophy um, by having the materials and the cells present. And just to give you a, a, an idea, basically that's due to the size of the graph. So this is a serial section. So basically what you can see the graphs uh, in the brain here. Uh, and what, what, what we're basically showing is the size of those graphs as we move through the tissue. So I think it's probably a one in six series. So at, at each one of these slices is, is, is approximately one in six. So it's about 100, 120 microns through the tissue. Um, between each one of these. And, but what you can see is when we have the material, the self-assembling peptide here, is these graphs are much larger, um, which is why we're seeing that improvement in the functional recovery. And this is actually one of my favorite pictures uh, from, the, from the study. Um, so this is a rat brain and you can see there was a huge lesion up here called, caused by that endothelium one administration. Um, and this is where we put the stem cell graphs, which are orange or yellow here and the fibers growing at them. And you can see the stem cells are fitting of the hydrogel quite well on that, that damaged cortical tissue. But really strikingly, what you can see is you can see that they're sending out these um, their white matter tracks, the neurons, and they're following the, the white matter tracks of the corpus callosum and they're innovating right down here in the base of the brain on the ipsilateral side of the animal, um, which is showing that these graphs are able to integrate within the, within the tissue. Um, the inflammation isn't killing the cells or sealing off that lesion site. But even more striking is it's crossing the corpus callosum into the contralateral side and you can even see innovation from these grafted cells right down in this side of the brain, which is accounting for um, much of the, the, the recovery that we're seeing. Okay, so we had a look at, um, at what these cells were sort of, uh, how they were differentiating and why we're sort of seeing that effect. Um, excuse me, I'll have a drink. Um, and so we, we staying for a whole bunch of different cell types, but I just wanted to show you what, why that's sort of occurring um, by looking at this new end stain. So that's a stain for neurons. Um, and what you can see is when we have the cell alone graph, these are very big graphs, is we get a very heterogeneous distri distribution of neurons within that graph. So at the edges here, because you've got these uh, neurons in the, um, in the um, endogenous tissue, they're secreting a whole bunch of growth factors. It's promoting, um, um, as you get diffusion of those growth factors into the graph, promoting differentiation. You can see that here. But as we go into the center of the graph where you're not, you, you're not getting those biomolecules diffusing, you can see there's basically no neurons at all. But when we have that IKV the epitope present, again, inspired by laminin, you can see we're getting a very homogeneous distribution of these neurons throughout the graft, um, which is a, again, accounting for what we're seeing in the, uh, in the behavior recovery. Okay, so well, we thought this is all fantastic. It looks great, but can we actually improve this system even further? Um, so instead of just presenting that IKVAV and that biomaterial to improve cell survival, uh, can we actually uh, present um, biologically relevant proteins? So in this case, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, can we present that in the material uh, to improve the, the graph survival? Now, the problem with this is that if we just put this uh, in cell culture media uh, into the incubator, so no enzymes, no, not in an animal at all, basically the half-life of this protein is about 30 minutes. You can see that here, and it's gone, pretty much completely gone after 24 hours. Now, I showed you that inflammation lasts for 21 days, right? So we need to be able to extend the presentation of this protein 
um, for protracted periods. And that's where um, Chiara and Alexandra came in um, and they did the, basically their PhDs on exactly that. And they managed to, these are sort of from release rates, um, but more importantly, this is, this is a, these are Westerns taken from uh, animal brain. So we've put the materials in that are carrying this BDNF and through using, a, optimizing the interactions between sort of electrostatic hydrophobic interactions between peptide fibrils and the protein, we can actually extend the presentations of that protein from let's say 30 minutes uh, if you just injected it in by itself out to greater than 28 days, um, which was which was pretty neat. So what effect did that have on the on the grafted cells when we put them into stroke? So you guys are familiar with um, with when we implanted the, the stem cells alone. I showed that previously. Um, again, collaborative with Project with Claire. So all the all the stem cell grafting and behaviour was done in, done in her lab. Um, with my students going down to, to assist. Um, you've, you're familiar with this one, when we did the lesion with the cells and just the peptide material, that's here. Um, but what you can see, whoops, something's going on here. What you can see is that when we have, and, oh, when we have the protein alone, like I told you, it's pretty much gone after 30 minutes. There's no difference between the cells and when we just have the protein alone. But when we have the material and the protein, I think you can see that those graphs are even bigger than when we have this the material alone. And this corresponded, we only looked at a three week time, time point here, but this corresponded to a drop from about, uh, I think that was about 12, 10 point, somewhere between 10.7 and 12, right down to, to about four, 3.7% atrophy. So we're getting an even better improvement when we have the proteins and, and those stem cells are included. Okay, and I just wanted to just finish uh, by acknowledging sort of my group. This is about half my group, half of them have gone for Christmas. Um, we were just having a, a quick beer for Christmas and I just wanted to uh, acknowledge all of my, um, my funders and, and industry support um, and I might stop sharing and we can maybe take some, take some questions. Cool. Thank you very much, Dave. No problem. Fascinating talk. Uh, stop sharing or not? Uh, no, not yet. Okay, there we go. Does that work? Yeah. Great. Um, all right, cool. Um, so, for all those attending, please do put questions through. We've had a couple that have come through, uh, Dave, uh, already. Do you want to, well, there's one asking you if you have PhD positions in your, <laughs> in your lab. Um, yeah, I mean, we're always looking for uh, PhD students and so on. Um, obviously, it's a competitive process to get um, PhD um, scholarships and, and so on. Um, but, uh, yep, well, uh, you know, if you can obtain a PhD scholarship, I'm always willing to have uh, people working in my group for sure. Great. Uh, when, while you're taking the second question, I'm just going to put in a link to a website that students that are interested in applying for a PhD can go to. Um, yep. So the second question uh, was when the brain, when you have a brain injury, um, is it a stress or a strain? Um, I suppose it depends on the, oh, I should click, uh, uh, sort of depends on the, um, on the type of injury, I suppose. So you could, if you have a disease, there's no stress or strain whatsoever. Um, so imagine something like Parkinson's disease, it's just a, a loss of neurons in the substantia nigra. Uh, but if you imagine a traumatic brain injury or a stroke, yes, you're gonna have an impact and you're gonna have both um, stresses and, and strains. So the strain is an issue because you'll get tearing of the tissue and then you get inflammation associated with that, which is detrimental to, to, um, to, to the brain repair. So yep, you'll, you'll probably have both. Uh, okay, so I have another question where we're looking at um, uh, asking me if we're using um, plant-based materials, so oligosaccharides, polysaccharides in the studies. Uh, yes, yep, for sure. So um, phacoidin um, is basically a polysaccharide. Um, so uh, yep, we're using the phacoidin to basically present that galactose moiety um, so that we can control that inflammation state. So actually, yeah, polysaccharides make up a huge part of the the self-assembling hydrovel system. For a lot of our work with bone, we use things like Versican and things like that also, which are polysaccharides. So yep, we can easily assemble proteins, polysaccharides, even viral vectors into the materials and get them through manipulating either their, their surface charges or the charges on the peptide fibrils or hydrophobic interactions. Um, we can exploit um, that to actually have highly soluble molecules presented for protracted periods.
Uh, so I have a question that says, when you said the scarring is done to maintain the integrity of the rest of the uninjured brain, did you mean a scar actually helps? If yes, in what way does it protect other parts of the brain? Uh, stop. Okay. okay, so you can imagine if you have um, a virus in your brain, for instance, right? Um, if your body can't, it's called phagocytosis. So if your body can't actually um, consume the virus or if you have a bit of metal in your brain or whatever and, you, and your body can't actually remove that, um, what can happen is that virus can attack the rest of the brain. That's called a bystander effect. So what your body actually does is it comes in and just forms a, a fibrous capsule or a scar around that, that virus, that protein that, that it can't actually remove in any other way. So once, you know, after a certain period of time, up to 21 days, if it can't remove it, it just encapsulates it. So it basically just isolates it, puts it in jail so that it can't actually affect the rest of the brain um, to preserve the rest of the architecture of, of the brain. So it is an important physiological event. Um, how to astrocytes proliferate in brain inflammation. Um, that's just, I, I suppose that's, that's, that's just what they do. So a neuron can't proliferate, but astrocytes do. So um, basically when you have a brain injury or something like that, you'll have the first thing that happens is um, microglia will come in. Um, so they're like a macrophage within the brain. And it's not, I suppose not super well known, um, but we, we probably assume that these microglia secrete certain molecules that then diffuse through the tissue and form a gradient for these astrocytes to come in, migrating and proliferate as they start to try and um, protect the, the integrity of the rest of the brain. So I have a question that asked me if the materials are biodegradable, biocompatible or not. Um, do the materials have side effects or not? Why? Um, so the materials are the amino acids. So they're basically protein inspired. Um, so they're exactly like the proteins within your brain, like laminin. So yes, they're, they're bi completely biocompatible, um, which are, I suppose is evidenced by the fact that we can control inflammation with them. Um, in terms of the biodegradability, they don't, they don't really, um, because they're a, uh, like a protein, they don't really degrade per se, but what, they, what, what actually happens is because it's a, a, a gel, um, is basically what will happen is that over time they'll fragment um, and, the, and the, the individual uh, peptide fibrils will then be removed, but they don't necessarily sort of de degrade as such, not like a, a, a polyester would. Um, is there is there other peptide molecules whose shelf life can be increased? Um, the shelf life is no problem actually because we generate these materials as a powder. Uh, we only form the hydrogel immediately because it needs to be sterile uh, immediately upon before implantation. So. Um, in terms of shelf life, there's no real problem. Um, and we do have, I, I have in the lab a whole library of these uh, different peptide uh, materials. So we can cull assemble them, we can present multiple um, different epitopes simultaneously within a single peptide fibril. We've shown that with synchrotron data. Um, so yeah, we can make a whole bunch of different peptides um, in it. We've found so far that the, um, the, the the uh, IKVAV from laminin is the best. We've also made a YIGSR from laminin, but that didn't, it worked well, but not as well as the IKVAV. Uh, okay, so there's a question I don't really understand. Um, so but there's one here, can, on this hydrophobic coating application in sensor surface, and, Hindrance of interaction with biomolecules. Can you? Hmm. I'm not quite sure I understand the, the two questions I have in front of me at the moment. Um, yeah, sure. If I could, um, I think we've been from Raj Kumar and Praneet. Uh, Raj Kumar, Rakesh Kumar, and Praneet. If you could just want to maybe type them in again with a few more details.
Um, so there's one question here I can answer. Um, so somebody has asked me um, that the brain doesn't have a regenerative capacity. Um, I think that's a statement, but actually um, that's recently probably been proven to be uh, incorrect. There is uh, adult neurogenesis does occur. Um, we do have stem cell niches in the adult brain, um, particularly in the subventricular zone, um, which you can, it can regenerate. Um, it's actually uh, reactive astrocytosis that's stopping that from occurring. Um, can we make it more regenerative by introducing faster dividing cells? Um, you you wouldn't, you well, you don't want to do that. Um, so the reason is that fast dividing cells are cancer. So, and one of the big things when we're doing um, stem cell transplantation uh, that we're always trying to control for is we, we don't want uh, fast uh, yeah, cell division because it will ultimately result in, the, in in cancer within the brain. So you've got to be very careful of that. Um, there's another question. If there is a viral challenge, it becomes difficult for the stem cells to proliferate. How could we ensure a sterile environment at the wound region? Okay, so I think the question might be referring to um, uh, repair from these uh, stem cells from the subventricular zone in the brain. Um, so I suppose like uh, what we really need to do, yeah, I suppose you, you, we don't necessarily, if your information response, we don't want to turn information off because if your information response isn't working, then yes, having um, a non-sterile wound, so uh, we would result in bacteria and everything, infection and, and ultimately perhaps death. But uh, if we have a, a strong inflammation response for that first 21 days, these can come in and try and clean that up. The real problem is, um, and the reason that um, uh, we don't get repair is it's the persistence of that response. Um, so then you get that scar formation. So what we really need to be able to do is control that scar, which is uh, what, what I was presenting on today. Um, so that we can actually have it initially and then turn it off where we want it to, to turn off. So we don't have persistence of that scarring. Um, I suppose the, if you want to find more information on my work, uh, it's all published in scientific journals. So um, it's all on the, probably the ANU website, Google Scholar, that sort of thing. Um, so, I have a rephrased question talking about mutations to DNA occurring in... There's not really any... Uh, when you have an injury or something like that, you'll have damaged DNA. You won't really have a mutation per se. Um, but with something like a disease, potentially you could. Um, so the, I'm not sure uh, in terms of what cell types that would occur on with diseases. It could be something like a dopaminergic neuron. Um, and so people actually, we don't do much of this in our lab. We actually look at actually just um, doing cell reprogramming, but people can do gene editing using CRISPR-Cas9 uh, and things like that to actually uh, remove, remove um, defective mutations and, and promote re repair and reconstruction that way, um, which is fine. Again, probably not relevant if you have this persistent uh, injury response um, from the astrocytes though. So that would only be for a lot of potential for diseases such as um, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, MS, things like that. Um, but when you're looking at uh, insult to the brain, um, not probably not relevant. Cool, great. Thank you, Dave. I think uh, maybe we'll give a minute or so if there's any more questions people don't put in, otherwise we may even finish on time. Had a long day of talking today, so my throat was starting to give up on me. <laughs> uh, look, thank you very much for doing this. We're keeping you on Friday evening. Um, look, I, I don't see any more questions coming in, so I think we can call it a night. Right. Dave, thank you very much um, on behalf of everyone for doing this, uh, for sharing all the work that you're doing and your group is doing. Um, all those attending, thank you for coming along. Thank you for those questions. Um, we've got yeah, a few more. Along, everyone. That was good. We've got a few more of these talks uh, to go in this series. Uh, they will come back next week uh, and they run into 
sort of first couple of weeks of July. So if you haven't registered, please do. Otherwise, we'll, we'll see you at those talks. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Enjoy it. Enjoy your weekend. Um, we'll see you next week. Thanks again, Dave. Appreciate Thanks, it. Folks. See ya.